All right, review problems, chapter three, number 369. The chemical substance in natural gas is composed, or is a compound called methane. In molecule, its molecules are composed of carbon and hydrogen. Each molecule contains four atoms of hydrogen and one atom of carbon. In this compound, for every 0.33597 grams of hydrogen, uh, you have one gram of carbon. Use this information to calculate the atomic mass of the element hydrogen. So, um, for every one gram of carbon-12, there's 0.33597 grams of hydrogen. And that grams of hydrogen is actually four hydrogen molecules. Atoms, sorry, four hydrogen atoms, right? So we have a sample of methane. We know that chemical formula is CH4 because it says there's four hydrogens for every carbon. So we have the chemical formula for methane, CH4, and we have, um, we know that there's this many grams of hydrogen and that many grams of carbon in every sample, okay? So uh, for every, we can draw a ratio here. One gram of carbon-12 has a mass of 12 grams per mole. There's 12 grams for every mole of carbon-12. And we can, we know that this ratio will be equal to 0.33597 grams um, over 4 times whatever the molar mass, grams per mole of hydrogen there are. All right? So for every 1 gram of carbon-12 we have, the ratio of 1 gram of carbon-12 over 12 grams per mole will be equivalent to this many grams of hydrogen, and that's how much 4 hydrogen are, we'll just say how much hydrogen there are, times, or over 4 times the molar mass here. The molar mass is how much 1 mole of hydrogen weighs, and 4 here is how many moles, equivalents of hydrogen are in this the given sample that they gave us. So basically 1 times 4x equals this 0.33597 times 12. 1 times 4x is the same as 4x equals 0.33597 times 12. So we take 0.33597 times 12 divided by 4 and we get 1.00791, and those are the units for that are grams per mole, and that's the uh, atomic mass of the element hydrogen. Okay, a certain element, 371. A certain element X forms a compound with oxygen in which there are two atoms of X for every three atoms of oxygen. X2O3. Three, oh, say that again. Did we do that right? Two atoms of X, yes. X2 for every three atoms of oxygen, O3. In this compound, 1.125 grams of X are combined with one gram of oxygen. 1.125, 1.125. 1 grams of X, 1 gram for every 1 gram of oxygen. Use this average, use the average atomic mass of oxygen to calculate the average atomic mass of X. Use your calculated atomic mass to identify the chemical X. So, oxygen has an atomic mass and we look at the periodic table, we look for oxygen, 16.00 grams. 16.00 grams, and those units again are grams per mole. Grams of oxygen for, mole, for every mole of oxygen. Right? This is how many grams of oxygen you need to have one mole of oxygen. Alright, so that's, where we're, that's the value we're going to use there. And we know there's 1.125 grams of X and uh, one gram of oxygen. Okay. So, the ratio, uh, the molar ratio, 
is two x's for three o's, all right? So we know that there's three o's. For every two x's, there's three oxygens, all right? And we also know the mass ratio here, which should be equivalent to the molar ratio, 1.125 grams of x, and uh, that's how many grams there are in, that in, one, in this specific compound for every one gram of oxygen. All right, so by solving this, we'll be able to solve for x, and that should be the, um, number of moles of oxygen, so here we go, or number of, uh, oh no, sorry, we want 3 times 16 here, 16 is how many grams for every mole, and then this will be in units of grams per mole, all right, because if you multiply how many grams there are for every mole, times every, every uh, how many moles you have, then this will be grams of oxygen down here. And this will be grams of x, whatever it is. And it'll have the same ratio here. All right, so 1 times 2x is 2x, cross-multiplying. And that should be equal to 1.125 grams of x times 3 times 16. So that's 54. All right? So 2x equals 54, divide both sides by 2, and it says x equals 27. All right, did we do that right? 27, so if we look on the periodic table for what atom has the mass of 27, and it looks like 26.98 uh, is aluminum, so x equals aluminum, and so this is Al2O3. All right, so let's recap that again. We have this many grams of X for every one gram of oxygen. And if we take the molar ratio, which is 2 to 3, and multiply it by the uh, atomic m mass of whatever X is and the atomic mass of what oxygen is, then the answer is going to be, if we solve for X here, then we're going to get the, again, grams per mole of whatever that mass is. Okay, uh, three it says seventy-three. If the if an atom of carbon twelve had been assigned a relative mass of twenty-four units, what would be the average atomic mass um, hydrogen relative to this mass? Well, this is kind of a, a trick question here. What they're saying is, if an atom of carbon twelve had been assigned a relative mass, so units are in relative mass of 24, what would be the average atomic mass of hydrogen relative to this mass? So the actual atomic mass wouldn't have changed, but uh, so there's no change, all right? So if the relative mass of carbon-12 had been assigned a mass of 24 units, then the units of hydrogen gas, or hydrogen, an atom of hydrogen would be two, but the mass of hydrogen would still be the same. Okay. 69.17% copper 36. Copper 63, sorry. 69.17% copper 63. 62, which has an atomic mass of 62.17%. 9393 and 30.83% copper 64, no 65, with a mass of 64.9278. And these are units of grams for every mole. Use these data to calculate the average atomic mass of copper. Average atomic mass of copper. So, when we find the average of something, 
we take a bunch of measurements and we divide it by all those measurements. Divide the, the resulting value by how many measurements we make. So for example, if I have a bag here, and inside this bag I have a bunch of copper atoms, all right? I pull the copper atoms out one by one. And the first one I pull out has a mass of this, 62.9396. The second one I pull out has a mass of that same one. So this is the, the uh, um, atom number one, and this is the mass. Atom number two, I pull it out, look at it, aha, it has a mass of 62.9396. Atom number three, pull it out, it has a mass of 62.9396, same as this guy up here. Atom four, oh, I pulled it out, it has a mass of 64.9278, all right? Pull out another one, atom five, 62.9396 on this, the fifth atom. All right, so that's how you would find the average, right? You would add up all these masses and divide it by how many atoms there were, five. And that makes sense. We're familiar with how to find the mass. Well, that's basically what this says. Somebody pulled carbon atoms out of a hat or you know, did an experiment to determine the mass of individual carbon atoms. And they found out that 69.17 out of 100 had this mass. And 30.83 out of 100 had this mass. Or 6,917 out of 10,000 had this mass and 3,083 out of 10,000 had this mass, okay? So if we think of these not as percentages, if we just think of them as the, how many times the ball came up having this mass and how many times the mass of the ball that we pulled out had that mass, all right? So then using that, we can understand why to solve this problem, we simply have to take 69.17, I have to get rid of this as well, 69.17 times 62.9396, all right, because instead of adding up the list of 62.9396, 69 times, right, because we said this is how many times out of 100 the ball had that mass. So we could add those all up on our calculator, but instead we'll just multiply this by that number and then we'll add that to this other one. 30.83, that's how many times the mass was 64.9278. All right, so that value right there 69.17 times we had this value, and 30.83 times we had that value. So now that's a total of how many times that we drew out of the hat? Well, the sum of those two right there is about 100, right? So we can divide that, let's see, 69.17 plus 30.83, that's 100 percent. So that's and on average, or an average of a hundred different times, we pulled the atom out of the ball, out of the bat. So, 69.17 times 62.9396, and that's 4353. Point. We have one, two, three, four significant digits, so that's it there. Plus 30.83 times 64.9278, 2002, rounded to the fourth significant digit. So we add that value to 4353. And we get that value, 6354. We divide that by 100, right? Because all this has to be divided by 100, because that's how many times we drew. And now that will be the average atomic mass of a copper atom, which is 63.54, or 55, 5.47, or 55. Okay? So 63.55 should be the average of the atomic mass of copper.
All right. All right. Review problem 377 now. Give the number of neutrons, protons, electrons, and the atoms of each of the following isotopes. A, radium 226. Radium 226. 226. Now, when we call uh, a, a, an atom, give a num an atom a number like carbon 12 or radium 226. First of all, we look for radium on the periodic table, and we see that it is element number 88. Element number 88. 88 indicates the number of protons, right? So protons, there's 88 protons. Neutrons, well, the mass. This value, the 226, radium 226 or carbon 12, that's the mass of one atom. And the units are grams of that number. How many grams for every one mole or one molecular unit of that material? So carbon 12, it takes 12 grams to get one molecular unit or one mole of carbon 12. Radium 226, <clears throat> it's a larger atom, so it takes more of them to actually get one mole of them more mass of them. So it takes 226 grams to get one molecular unit or one mole of radium-226. So the mass is 226. Um, the number of neutrons, every neutron contributes a mass unit and every proton contributes a mass unit. Therefore, we can determine the number of neutrons by taking the 226 and subtracting the 88. And that's 138. So we're supposed to determine the number of protons, neutrons, protons, and electrons in these atoms. All right. So radium-226, there's no indication that there's a charge. So the number of electrons has to equal the number of protons, which is 88. If there's more electrons, we would have a negative charge. If there's fewer electrons, then there would be more protons. Therefore, we'd have a positive charge. 88 protons and electrons, 138 neutrons. All right, so it says give the number of neutrons, protons, and electrons in lead 206. <coughs> this is part A, so here's uh, lead PB 206. Protons, electrons, and neutrons. And the neutron, or the um, mass also helps us. Mass here is 206. 206, we can look for lead on the periodic table, PB, and we see it element number 82. 82, therefore there's 82 protons. And does it give us any charge? Nope, it's just lead 80, or 206, so it's 82 protons and the same number of electrons, 82 electrons. Number of neutrons now, again, this mass number is neutrons plus protons. That number up the top left of an element, number of protons plus neutrons. So 206 is that number minus the mass due to the protons, 82, and that number is 124. So we have uh, 82 protons, 82 electrons, and 124 neutrons. C is carbon-14. C-14. Carbon-14, the mass number is 14 protons. We can look at carbon and we see that there's six protons. So there's protons, six, electrons, six, neutrons. Well, it's 14 minus six because 14 is the mass, right? So it's uh, eight neutrons, right? eight neutrons, because eight plus 16 is 14. Okay, so that's C. Here's B, here's C, and we'll do D here. D is sodium 23. Na23. Mass, again, is that 23. Protons, we can look at our periodic table and see that sodium is element number 11. So protons, there's 11 protons. Um, there are, therefore, electrons, 11 electrons. And 23 minus 11 will tell us how many um, neutrons, and that's 12 neutrons. Okay. So, D.
23 mass units, sodium 23, protons and electrons 11, neutrons 12. Oops, that was 377. That was 377, now we're doing 379. Iodine 131 is used to treat overreactive thyroid. It has a mass of 130.9061 units. You have the number of protons and neutrons and electrons in the atom. So this is iodine 131. Is that right? Yes, iodine 131. It's, um, we want to know the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, electrons, and the mass. The mass is 131. The number of protons, we look at iodine on the periodic table and see it's element number 53. 53, that number is also the number of protons. 53 is also the number of electrons then, because there's no charge on this species here. And the number of neutrons is 131 minus 53. All right, and that's 78 neutrons. So um, they give you 130.9061 as the mass. And that is the average mass of an iodine-131. But iodine-131 means that it has the given, or this value that we just described here. So I'm just double-checking the back of the book. We haven't, let's look at our number three here, 379. Fifty-three, fifty-three. 78. All right. So that mass of 130.9061 is just the average mass. All right. Use the periodic table, but not table 3.3, to write the symbol for the ions of, this is 381 now. So in number 381, we're asked to write the symbol of the ions, and we're told that we can use the periodic table. Okay, to write the symbol of the ions. And the ions that we're going to be writing are potassium, bromine, magnesium, sulfur, and aluminum. So we have the atoms, potassium, bromine, magnesium, sulfur, and aluminum. Magnesium, sulfur, and aluminum. These are the atoms, right? And we want to write their associated ions or the ions that we would predict they would form based on their location on the periodic table. All right, so I have a periodic table here. We can look at our periodic table and we can uh, find these elements on the periodic table. Uh, first, let's look at potassium. Potassium we see is right here. Potassium is in the first row. It has 19 protons. Again, all elements form or when an element forms an ionic compound, the reason why it forms an ionic compound is so that it can attain an electron configuration of that of these noble gases. So they want to have the same number of electrons as the noble gases do. So when we see a, a potassium is over here at 19, it wants to have the same electrons as one of these. And argon has 18, so that's the closest it can get to by, again, if it has 19 electrons to start off with, if it loses one electron, it's going to have the electron configuration of argon. So we know that potassium, which has 19, so this is the number of electrons the atoms have, 19, it's going to want to become like uh, argon, which has 18. So it, its ion is going to be a K with a positive charge because it wants to have 18 electrons. Now this ion right here, the number of electrons in this ion is going to be 18. And that's the same as, this is the noble gas, which is, has the same uh, configuration of, that's the same noble gas configuration as argon. Okay? So, next one, bromine. We look at bromine. Bromine has 37. It's down here on the periodic table. 37, oh, sorry, 35. Bromine has 35 uh, electrons. All right, so this is the electrons of the atom. 35. Now the ion, what kind of ion would it like to form? Well, if it can be like krypton, which is right next to it, and have 36 electrons, it would have a stable electron arrangement. Okay? So, 
to give it 36 electrons, it needs to accept one more electron. Giving one more electron to bromine would give it a net negative charge. It would have 35 protons, and now it would have 36 electrons. Same number of electrons as krypton, right? So that makes the ion that bromine would like to form a Br minus. Magnesium. We look at magnesium here. It is the second column, second family. Magnesium has 12 electrons to start with. The neutral atom, 12 electrons. If it is going to attain a noble gas configuration, it can attain that of neon or argon. But argon is to gain to get argon, it would have to gain six electrons. So instead, it's going to lose two electrons and gain the noble gas configuration of neon. Neon is the closest to it. So it has to lose, how many did we say? Go from 12 to that of neon, which is 10. It's going to have to lose two electrons. In losing two electrons, it's going to have, again, looking at magnesium, started with 12 electrons and 12 protons. And if we lose two electrons, it now has 12 protons, but only 10 electrons. So that's a net of a positive two. So we write on there, a magnesium plus two ion is what magnesium would like to form. Sulfur. Sulfur has 16 electrons to start off with, and we can see that it's close to argon, which has 18 electrons. So how can sulfur attain an electron configuration of 18 if it has 16? Well, it can gain two. Two what? Two electrons. If it gains two electrons, it's going to have a net negative two charge. All right, so it's not enough to say just a negative charge. It's going to have a net negative two charge. Aluminum. Aluminum starts with 13. Aluminum can either go to argon and gain five electrons, but it's closer for it to go back to neon, back to neon, which has 10 electrons. Therefore, aluminum is going to have a plus three charge. It had 13 electrons and protons to start with, but to have a noble gas configuration, it has to lose three of those electrons and end up with a positive three charge. All right, so that is number 381. Okay. Number 383 says, write formulas for ionic compounds formed between sodium and bromine. Sodium and bromine, potassium and iodine, barium and oxygen. Let's just do one right now, sodium and bromine, okay? So to find out what kind of ionic compounds would form between these two elements, we have to identify what kind of ions they would like to form based on the number of electrons that they have and the number of electrons of the noble gas configuration that they want to have. So we look at sodium. Sodium is in the first row. It's element number 11. Element number 11 on the periodic table, that means 11 electrons, 11 protons, and neon has 10. So sodium wants to form a plus one charge. Now you're, you're seeing a trend, right? All of these elements in the first row always form a plus one. All of these elements in the second column, sorry, first column, second column, all of these elements in the second column all form a plus two. And all of these elements in the seventh column always form a minus one. All of these elements in the sixth column always form a minus two, right? Because they're always trying to attain an electron configuration of a noble gas. So sodium and bromine are going to come together. Sodium is going to want to form a plus one. Bromine is going to want to form a minus one. Therefore, it's a one-to-one -one ratio to balance that charge. They form that ionic compound, and the result is sodium bromide. All right, number 387. Um, we're looking at the different kinds of compounds that can form between lead tin, manganese, iron, and copper, and oxygen, all right? So we start off with lead, PB. We have to look and determine what kind of ions lead can form. And we've seen in the book that lead can form a plus two, or you can get a lead plus four ion, all right? So if this is gonna combine with oxygen, again, oxygen always forms a minus two ion. 
then you can have the PB2 forming with the oxygen one in a one to one ratio, but you can also have PbO2 where you have this is lead four, lead four oxide, and this is lead two oxide. All right, so those are the two compounds that can form between lead and oxygen. All right. 387A, 387B, we're looking for tin and tin oxide, right? So we have the same situation, SN plus 2 or SN plus 4. And in the SN plus 2, we have the uh, oxide ion again, O minus, right? SNO and SNO2, right? This one here is the tin what? Tin well, the charge on this ion is a plus 2, so it's the tin 2 oxide, and this is the tin 4 oxide, tin 4 oxide, right? Okay, 387C, 387C, we're looking for manganese, manganese, 387C. All right, so manganese, look in the book, and we see that manganese forms a plus two, and manganese forms a plus three. So if we want to form manganese two oxide, that's combining this with oxygen. Oh, this oxygen is a minus two, sorry. Combining this with oxygen, then it's gonna be a one-to-one -one ratio. That's um, manganese and oxygen. This one is called manganese two oxide, because the manganese two ion is combined. And then if we want to form manganese 3 oxide, we're going to need two of these and three of these. So this is manganese 2 oxide, and this is manganese 3 oxide. All right, there's 387C for manganese. And now we're looking for the iron, iron, Fe plus 2 or Fe plus 3. There's our oxygen minus 2 again. Iron 2 would just be FeO, the iron 3, Fe2O3, because we would need three of these and two of those to balance each other out. This is our iron 2 oxide, the 2 plus charge on the iron here, so therefore we call it iron 2 oxide. This is our iron 3 oxide because this iron contains a plus 3 charge. All right? All right, that's our iron, and then we have our, let's see, 387, we have our copper. So we have a Cu and plus and a Cu plus 2. So we are going to form a copper 1 oxide and a copper 2 oxide. The copper 1 oxide is going to be like this because we need 2. Again, this is copper 1 because it has a plus 1 on the copper. The copper 2 oxide is going to be like that. So we have our copper 1 oxide and our copper 2 oxide. All right, good. 389. All right, name the following ionic compounds. 389. 389. Uh, CAS, it's an ionic compound. It contains the main group elements. Main group elements, where's my periodic table? are these ones right here, right? It contains this section, these first two columns, and, or these columns over here, all right? These, this little section right here, all right? Those, if it contains those two, then, and we know that calcium can't form any other kind of ion, only a plus two, and so this is just called calcium sulfide, calcium sulfide. All right? Uh, next, we have AlBr3, and this is, again, aluminum bromide. Aluminum always forms a plus 3 charge, therefore there's no other form of ion that aluminum could be. Therefore, we don't have to have aluminum 3 bromide or anything like that because it's just aluminum bromide. That's the only way that we can make aluminum bromide right there. Next, we have Na3P, Na3P, sodium 
phosphide, phosphide, all right, just like sodium chloride, but instead of chlorine, it's phosphorus, so it's sodium phosphide, sodium phosphide. BA3AS2, BA3AS2, this is the barium ion, this is the um, arsenic ion atom, which is forming an arsenate ion. Ion. So this is barium arsenate. All right. So arsenic forming an arsenate ion. All right. Oh no, sorry. Arsenic. 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 So arsenic ion is forming barium arsenide. Ars chloride. Barium arsenide. 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 <laughs> there you go. Barium arsenide. All right, what's the next one? Um, let's see. What number? 389. Barium arsenide. Okay. Last one. Rubidium and sulfur. RB and sulfur. Rubidium and sulfur come together in a combination of RB2. S, all right, so this is rubidium, sulfur, sulfur goes to sulfide, rubidium, sulfide, rubidium, sulfide, okay, all right, what's next, number 391, name the following compounds, or molecular compounds, these are molecular compounds, all right, 391, following molecular compounds, all right, uh, SiO2, SiO2, silicon dioxide, silicon dioxide. It's a, it's a uh, two nonmetals coming together, right? Not like before where we had a metal and a nonmetal. This is, these are molecular compounds. So we have a different naming system. We use the monodi tri naming system. Look through your chapter there to, to remind yourself of that one. Xenon, part B, so this is A, B, xenon. Tetra, four means tetra fluoride. Xenon tetra fluoride. And our standards for this are carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. All right? We remember that this is the combination of two nonmetals, and this is also the combination of two nonmetals. So we name it the same way we name carbon monoxide or dioxide. All right, P4O10. Phosphorus, tetraphosphorus, deca oxide. Deca, deca for ten, or decimal, or decade. Right? Tetraphosphorus decaoxide. So sorry about that. This last one is dichlorine hepta oxide. Hepta. Alright. We are draw writing the names of ionic compounds using the stock system. Alright, the stock system is the one where we identify what the charge is on the cation here or the metal. And that's necessary because you use the stock system whenever there are multiple ionic states that the metal ion can have. Iron again can be a plus two or a plus three, but we can tell by looking at the sulfur, the sulfur only can be a minus two. So that means if they're coming to a one-to-one -one ratio, it must be iron with a plus two charge. Therefore, this is iron two sulfide, iron two sulfide. And this one here, copper with one oxygen, Oxygen has to be a minus two. That means this is copper two oxide because the copper ion that came together with one oxygen ion has to be a copper plus two ion. All right, the next one, SNO2. SNO2, well, if there's two O2 minuses, that means whatever the tin has has to be, uh, if there's only one of them, has to be a plus four. This side has to contribute a plus four if this right side is contributing a minus four. Therefore, this is tin, each tin has a four plus on it. Therefore, it's tin four oxide, tin four oxide. All right, our last one here, we have COCl2. Uh, and then this is has six waters associated with each C or per COCl2. So this is a copper chloride hexahydrate. 
no, cobalt, sorry, cobalt chloride hexahydrate. Cobalt chloride hexahydrate. But the question is, what kind of cobalt is it? Is it a plus two ion or a plus three ion? And we see here the cobalt has to be a plus two because there's two Cl minuses. Two Cl minuses, that means that one cobalt has to have a plus two. So it's a cobalt two chloride hexahydrate. Cobalt two chloride hexahydrate. All right, name the following uh, compounds. If necessary, refer to table 3.5. All right, four. and that's going to help us answer these questions. The first one, NaNO2. NaNO2. We look at NO2. Nit it's not the nitrate, but it's the nitrite ion, right? So we have the nitrite ion, and so this is called sodium nitrite. All right, our next one, KMNO4. MNO4. We look at the MNO4. We see it's the uh, permanganate ion. So this is potassium permanganate, all right? Uh, MgSO4, 7H2O, MgSO4, 7H2O, this is magnesium, and we look at this on the, on the um, chart, this is the sulfate ion, magnesium sulfate, heptahydrate, heptahydrate, magnesium sulfate, heptahydrate, okay. Oh, this is 395. And our last one, KSCN, potassium, and the SCN ion is a thiocyanate ion. All right? So, potassium thiocyanate ion. Yes, potassium thiocyanate. So that's called potassium thiocyanate. All right, so that's 395. Now we're on to 397. Identify the following as molecular or ionic and give its name. All right. So A is chromium chloride. It's chromium 2 chloride. We know that chromium is a transition metal, therefore it can have multiple states. We know that chromium is a transition metal because it's right here, right in the middle of the periodic table here. And this section right here, these and these ones down here, are our transition metals, okay? So this section right in here, and these two down here, okay? So that's our, our uh, transition metals. Uh, therefore, we have to use the stock system, which is telling the chromium, telling the um, person who's listening to you or reading your stuff that this has a plus two charge, so it's chromium two chloride, all right? And it's an ionic compound because of the combination of a metal and a nonmetal. All right, S, let's see, what's it say, 397, make sure we have it written right, S2Cl2, S2Cl2. Okay, this is S, sulfur, sulfur, you can look and see that it's not a metal, it's a nonmetal. Chlorine, also a nonmetal, therefore this is disulfur dichloride, disulfur dichloride. All right, it's a molecular compound. It's not ionic. The next one, NH4C2H3O2. NH4C2H3O2. This NH4 is an ammonium ion. We're going to become familiar with that. It's in the polyatomic ion, table 3.5. Um, this here is the acetate ion. Therefore, this is an ionic compound because this is a polyatomic ion with a positive charge. This is a polyatomic ion with a negative charge. This is one of the only compounds that kind of gets confusing in terms of identifying it as an ionic compound because this is a, a positive charge here. So all of these are nonmetals, but because ammonium forms a positive charge and it's combining with a polyatomic ion, therefore this is an ionic compound and it's called ammonium acetate. Ammonium acetate. All right, the next one, SO3. Two nonmetals. We use the di-tri system, just like the carbon dioxide, sulfur trioxide, right? Sulfur trioxide, molecular compound. E, 
uh, we have potassium, metal, so we know that this is a uh, ionic compound. IO3 is the iodate ion. Let's see, is that on our energy? Uh, F is P4O6. Both nonmetals, it's a molecular compound. Potassium, or sorry, uh, phosphorus, tetraphosphorus, hexa oxygen. Tetraphosphorus, hexa oxygen. And that's the name of that compound. All right, get our eraser here. All right, uh, cal CA, calcium, SO3. Okay, SO3, now we just named the compound SO3. When an SO3 is by itself without a charge, we call that sulfur trioxide. But in this case, it looks like the SO3 has a plus two charge. We know that because the calcium has to have, sorry, a minus two charge. We know that because the calcium has to have a plus two charge. And so this is an ionic compound. We knew that already because calcium is a metal. This is called the sulfite ion, sulfite ion. All right, so this is, and you can see, is that, on, is that one in the table? SO4, SO3, yeah, sulfite ion, good. So we have the calcium sulfite, and that's the name of that compound, and it's an ionic compound, calcium sulfite. AG, silver, cyanide, CN, cyanide ion. So this is called, whoops, this is the letter H, this is the letter E. This is called silver cyanide, silver cyanide. All right, um, I, HI. Silver is one of the compounds, or one of the elements that is in the trans is a transition metal, um, but it only forms a plus one charge. Now, it's not true that it only forms a plus one charge, but almost always only forms a plus one charge. So therefore, we call this silver, we don't have to call it silver one cyanide, but if you wanted to call it silver one cyanide, that would be fine as well, in, in, my, in, my, in terms of my opinion. All right, uh, officially it's just called silver cyanide because it only has a plus one charge. All right, zinc bromide. Zinc is also kind of in that category. Zinc usually, almost always, only forms a plus two ion. Therefore, you're going to find that they don't call this zinc two bromide, they just call it zinc bromide. And this is an ionic compound again. We have a metal with some nonmetals. All right. IJ, the last one here, H2SE, okay, um, H2SE, SE is a uh, nonmetal, hydrogen is also a nonmetal, right, so dihydrogen selenide, selenide, so selenium goes to the selenide ion, so dihydrogen selenide, all right, uh, you also might find this called hydrogen selenide, hydrogen selen or, sorry, a, a hydride of selenium or selenium hydride, all right? So you might call it selenium hydride, but the official appropriate way would be hydrogen selenide. Okay, so when they have two answers like that, we won't be putting those types of things on uh, problems where you have to know both of the answers. Okay, so... 399. Write the formula for the following. Write the formula for the following. Sodium monohydrogen phosphate. Sodium monohydrogen phosphate. So sodium monohydrogen phosphate, PO4, all right? Sodium monohydrogen phosphate. So the phosphate ion is PO4, the monohydrogen phosphate ion is HPO4. So this is sodium monohydrogen phosphate. Lithium selenide, lithium selenide, all right? So you can look and find out what the selenide ion's charge is, and we see that it's gonna have a minus two charge, therefore we need two lithiums, because lithium has a plus one charge. This is our lithium selenide. Chromium-3 acetate. Chromium-3 acetate. So chromium and the acetate, which is C2H3O2, all right, 
Now, I put parentheses because I know we're going to need three of these, because if chromium has a plus three charge, which is indicated by the three in the chromium three acetate, and acetate has a minus one charge, therefore we're going to need three of them. All right, uh, disulfur deca fluoride. Disulfur fluoride deca, all right, so disulfur deca fluoride. Disulfur, two sulfurs, deca fluoride, 10 fluorides. All right, nickel two cyanide. Nickel two cyanide has a plus one charge, therefore we're going to need two of these plus, or sorry, minus one charge, two of these minus ones for the nickel, which has a plus two charge, as indicated by the nickel two. All right, we have iron three oxide. Iron three oxide. Iron three means it's a plus three. Oxygen minus two again. So therefore, it's Fe2O3, as we described previously. We're going to need two of these and three of these so that the charges balance out. Right? So this is iron three oxide. Iron three oxide. Antimony pentafluoride. Antimony pentafluoride. All right. So antimony has a symbol Sb. Okay. Antimony Sb. And we have penta pentafluoride. Five pentagon. Five sided. Right. Antimony pentafluoride. Just one antimony. This is a molecular compound. Antimony and fluoride are all uh, both um, nonmetals. Okay, semi-metal and a nonmetal. Antimony pentafluoride. Antimony pentafluoride. All right, so now we're on to 3101. Write the formula for the following: ammonium sulfide. Ammonium sulfide. Ammonium ion NH4 has a positive one. Sulfide ion. A minus two, right? Not to be confused with the sulfite or the sulfate, right? Sulfide. Therefore, we're going to need NH4 twice for every one sulfur. So that's our ammonium sulfide. All right? Chromium 3 sulfate hexahydrate. Chromium 3 sulfate hexahydrate. Chromium 3 sulfate SO4 2 minus. Uh, this we got from the table, if we didn't know it, hexahydrate. So we're going to have six waters. All right, how are these going to come together? Well, it looks like we're going to need two of these, Cr2, SO4. We're going to need three of those, and then we have our six hydrate. Chromium, three sulfate hexahydrate. All right, silicon tetrafluoride. Silicon tetrafluoride. We can tell by the naming, it's a molecular compound. Silicon tetrafluoride. SI4, uh, silicon tetrafluoride. Molybdenum 4 sulfide. Molybdenum. Molybdenum 4. And then the sulfide ion, we know, is a minus 2. All right? Uh, oh, sorry, molybdenum is MO. Molybdenum 4 sulfide. All right? Uh, and then the ratio, we're going to need M. O and then two S's for every MO, right? Because this we need two minus twos to make up for that one plus four. Molybdenum four sulfide. Tin four chloride. Tin four chloride. SN with a plus four, that's the tin four, and then CL it has to be a minus one, right? Tin four chloride, therefore it's N SN Cl4. Tin four chloride, hydrogen selenide. Hydrogen selenide. All right, so hydrogen selenide, that's what I, what I referred to earlier, that you also might call it dihydrogen selenide, right? So H2SE, selenide, we know has to form a minus two charge. Hydrogen has to form a plus charge, all right? So we're going to have to have two hydrogens to combine with the selenide. Hydrogen selenide. Tetraphosphorus heptasulfide. G. Tetraphosphorus. Phosphorus. All right. Tetraphosphorus heptasulfide. Tetraphosphorus. Phosphorus hepta seven sulfide. Hepta sulfide. All right. Tetraphosphorus heptasulfide. Okay. So that is that. 
Last one, the compounds Se2S6 and Se2S4 have been shown to be anti-dandruff agents. What are their names? Okay, this is 3103. Uh, we have Se2S6. Oops, C2S6 and Se2S4. All right. This is a selenium. This is a sulfur. The sulfur gets the ide, sulfide ending, right? So di selenium hexa sulfide, di selenium tetra sulfide, and those are their names. All right. So that's three one zero three.